didn't work. <laughs> no, why did it work? Okay, we're ready to roll. Welcome everyone. Thanks for your patience uh, while well, we're just getting getting warmed up here. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you to the Department of Art and Design's Fall 2022 Speaker Series. Uh, it's my pleasure to open this forum with a land acknowledgement. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Uh, this is our fourth talk in the Visual Art and Design Speaker Series this fall. Uh, this talk is going to run from 2 till approximately 2.45 p.m., um, although we're doing a Q&A format uh, this afternoon. Um, this talk is being recorded uh, and will be uploaded to the Art and Design YouTube channel afterwards. Um, everyone should be muted upon entry. If you can stay muted during the presentation, uh, that really helps everyone to be able to hear, um, but you are also very welcome to unmute and ask questions audibly with your voice. Um, and if that's not available or un it's uncomfortable to you, uh, you're also welcome to use the chat function and I'll keep an eye on the chat um, and relay your questions for you. Um, okay, please join me uh, in welcoming uh, our speakers today. Uh, so Cynthia Sifa Malanga. Uh, Cynthia was born in Lumumbashi in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1997. Cynthia graduated her third year in 2020 at Artist Proof Studio in printmaking, combining techniques such as intaglio, lino cut, and silk screen. Cynthia's work explores the beauty constructs through her lived experience as a Black woman and those around her. Using mixed media, she creates moments as conversations representing thoughts and emotions in domestic spaces, which function to challenge stereotypes and interrogate misconceptions of beauty. Cynthia has exhibited in several international shows and art fairs like London Art Fair and Akka Art Fair. She currently lives and works in Johannesburg. Uh, and joining us in conversation with Cynthia today is Gillian Ross. Uh, Jillian Ross is a leading collaborative master printer. Jillian returned to Canada in 2020, uh, and she has been the master printer and director of the David Crutt workshop in Johannesburg, South Africa, for the past, I have 16 years here in jail, but I think that's maybe old, old number of years. Um, Jill uh, has been working with celebrated South African and international artists in collaborative printmaking. Uh, Ross's most notable ongoing collaboration exists with William Kentridge. Since 2006, uh, Ross has collaborated with the artist in creating over 150 editions. Uh, Ross has a major emphasis on working with established and emerging artists and on supporting education through workshops as part of ongoing programs. Uh, Jillian's collaborations have been exhibited in South Africa, Europe, the United Kingdom, North America, and Australia, and can be found in collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Print Study Center at the University of Alberta, the Museum of Toledo, and the Yale University Art Gallery. Uh, and as we'll hear a bit more about today, uh, recently Jill has collaborated with Cynthia in the production of a print edition. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen uh, and pass mm -hmm. things over to Jill and Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jill. Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know if anybody has any questions <laughs> right off the bat for Cynthia. From some of uh, you guys were, uh, those of you who are fortunate, fortunate enough to watch um, her video that she put together. If there's any questions right away, then please, by all means give them an ask um, with, I've prepared a little bit about the print uh, collaboration. I've prepared a slide presentation, which we're really very happy to speak about as well and, or, or get straight into. But you guys, if there's any questions right off the bat, please raise your hands, ask away. 
for Cynthia right now, it's late in the evening. It's like 11 o'clock at night. You know, she's kind of in the summer and the rain. We're in blizzards. <laughs> so it's <Yeah>. like <laughs> the polar opposites. And it's kind of been like that working process back and forth in any case. Hey, Cynthia, a little bit. It's like yeah, slow it and steady. It feels like, I don't know, sometimes, you know, you're reaching through the computer and it feels like, okay, Cynthia, are you there? And she's like, yeah, I'm in the Here's summer the over here. <laughs> you know, it's like this push and pull. So we're really happy to jump in. No one has any questions? I see Jesse making a move there. Maybe there's a <laughs> painting student. So I think we have a printmaking class and a painting class joining us today, as well as a number of MFA students as well, um, which is great. Jesse, you're totally welcome to just unmute and hop in if folks have questions. We can wave to all the students. <laughs> We are happy to be here. Thanks for speaking to us. And we're kind of looking forward to hearing what Jill has to say. And then we'll have some questions for you. OK? Yeah, that's super. Um, so Cynthia and I, I guess, uh, started working together. Late? <laughs> Late 2020, I think. Because I was still in my third year by then, and um, I think we were introduced in 2020, and then we started working on the prints in early 2021. Yeah, and sometimes I think that those are some of the most important <laughs> kind of little tiny details that people need to, to know about. How long projects take, how long it takes for kind of a result to happen, how many, how many little bits and pieces go in between. Um, as you're getting to know each other. So um, Lucy yeah. McGarry is a friend of mine and somebody I've worked with for almost 20 years, I think. Um, and she runs basically uh, artsy, but in Africa. And it's for all of Africa and it's called Latitudes Online. And Lucy made, did, um, uh, had an art fair in 2019 and Cynthia and I hadn't met. And I... Hi, Exactly. I was still working at David Crew Projects and I was there for 16, 17 years before I, I moved back to Canada in 2020. And Lucy McGarry's art fair kind of started looking at art fairs in a different way. Instead of presenting all the galleries, showing all of the work for, for each of their represented artists, Lucy's art fair um, allowed independent artists to show their work. So it allowed them to be in control, which I think is actually a very important thing. And I think is very different. There are huge commercial galleries in Johannesburg, huge with spaces in Johannesburg and in Cape Town and others in London that are moving into North America, actually. And then they're present, representing more and more artists from all over Africa, as well as South Africa. There's a huge commercial base in Johannesburg, Cape Town, a little bit in Durban. So there's a huge support structure. There's also huge amounts of collaborative print studios, which I think is quite an amazing feature that I think that a lot of people don't quite know about. But there's one that specializes in lithography. There's the Artist Brew Studios where um, Cynthia um, studied and trained for three years, which means that she would have done all of the print processes, which is as uh, in, in some of the universities in Johannesburg was less likely in actual fact. So Artist Proof Studios gave you a really thorough understanding of everything and hands-on experiences. And then you were working, presenting work at art fairs, presenting work for students, which I think is an incredibly rewarding experience. And I think especially in Edmonton, they have SNAP, which after you're finished at university, you can go work at SNAP and they have a gallery, Cynthia, as well as print facilities for everybody to use in the back, which is fantastic. So anyway, so sorry, I'm kind of, saying I have been working in the in the, well yeah I'm kind of <laughs> summarizing kind of how we come to be is that when uh, Lucy turned her art fair and went online almost immediately as 2020 and the pandemic hit and then all of a sudden it allowed all of these artists a platform on which to exhibit a platform on which that they could control and I found the only way that when I moved to Canada the only way for communication wasn't at that point, wasn't Zoom, it was WhatsApp. So I have been on WhatsApp. I 
sometimes don't know how to compose an email anymore, I'm gonna have to say, <laughs> because I'm on WhatsApp so often. And part of what I'm gonna share in my presentation too, and Cynthia will jump in and out, is just how, how and you said it in your presentation too, is how many conversations we had, because that's what collaborative projects are all about. And Lucy McGarry was the person who put us in touch, the two of us in touch. I have long time worked for William Kentridge, and he asked me to find a studio in Canada that could do photogravure, where we could work from a distance and try to work in large scale. That seed was planted in early 2020. And I spoke to Lucy a few months later and she said, I have two artists I would love you to work with. So I think it took us probably eight months actually from the first moment we met, Cynthia, I think, until we actually worked yeah. together. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there was like eight. Was, but somewhere around there. <laughs> Yeah. And it was a lot of videos back and forth. So um, I don't know if there's anything you want to say, Cynthia, it's kind of if that gives enough of a precursor to this presentation. <laughs> um, well, yeah, she was just uh, giving like a background of um, her, I think, how she met uh, Lucy because they're close friends and how I got into Latitudes, which um, I have mentioned in the video, but I got into Latitudes when I was in my third year and then through Latitude I was able to meet um, Jillian and then show her all my drawings and then speak um, about how we we're going to go about the technique. I remember her sending a lot of materials and research stuff for me to look at before I went on and um, worked on the drafting film and then from there we started having the whole back and forth conversation videos and such so I think the presentation that Jill has set up is um, very, I think it explains the whole process. Okay, I'll put it on. So, um, I guess, <laughs> When I, when I first started looking at Cynthia's uh, work, she sent me a file with a whole bunch of different paintings, drawings, um, line of cuts, a kind of, I asked her for as many different media as possible. My job as a collaborative printer more than anything else is to try to figure out how to translate someone's work from I don't like using the word originals <laughs> because I all at printmaking these are also originals, but at the same time in translating someone's paintings or their sculptures into 2D or taking some snippets of their work that we can focus on and kind of as a starting point to jump in. What is amazing though is because of uh, the University of Alberta, because we are working in photogravure, that was the technique. There's something very nice about that, about saying, here's the path forward, here's how you go down the road. You have one technique available to you, but how, how are we gonna explore it? Cynthia is a painter, she's not a photographer. So we have photogravure. So her paintings, as you can see, even in this photograph are very colorful. Her drawings, however, she does charcoal drawings as well. And what I noticed more and more, and this is what I loved about Instagram as well, is that you can look I can see what she's posting. I can see what she's working on. And then you just have small conversations and ask questions on repeat over and over and over again. She also shared these two line of cuts with me very early on. And what became very recognizable for me, one was the color, which I was very excited about. A lot of the work that I've done in my career is black and white, just because I specialize in intaglio. Um, the majority of people want to be very traditional. But here, Cynthia worked on multiple plates. She was hand painting things. She's added collage and she's added pattern. So to me, those, are, those features stand out uh, quite a lot. So I kept analyzing these two photographs, photos. And this is the, the project she was working on when we first got introduced. So I started working on a photogravure project and I said to Stephen Dixon, and I had also known about the process of direct gravure, which instead of um, translating a photograph 
or etching a photograph into a copper plate for printing, you etch a drawing into a copper plate for etching. And I, I knew about this process, but I never tried it. So I wasn't sure which inks to use and if you could use charcoal and what kind of medium. So this is where Stephen Dixon understands everything, <laughs> truthfully. He is, he's the photogravure guru. So these, these, are the, these are the prints that I sent to Cynthia in the mail. These are Stephen's tests. And this is what I love about collaborative printmaking too. Is my role as the collaborator is to talk to the artists and also the technical team. I am quite often kind of move in between those two roles. Um, and I also showed Cynthia that there's these different papers that we can work on. So I love the process of Shinkale. And in my presentation, I show how we worked with Shinkale for, for Cynthia's three prints. And this, is, this was some of the correspondence between us. And then it was like these little tiny videos like this through the mail. So everything that she had, had worked on previously, these paintings, and Cynthia, I don't mean to speak for you here, always had these cutouts. They always had these little tiny magazine covers. And do you want to talk about them, Cynthia? Um, not really, but um, where do you so get them? I, so most of them they are from magazines, and I have like this old newspapers, and I also used to take a few photos uh, of my own because in third year we were taught to source our own um, references. So I'll source from that, and also some images from like Instagram, and then print them out, then cut them out in different um, different shapes, and then create a new body um, or a new figure from all of that. Just like, um, should I say, assemble assembling all of those pieces and making um, one figure or whatever that would look like. So I source from different um, magazines, um, photographs, and things like that. So I loved this idea and I saw it in every one of her works. And as I was saying, it, it's, it's predominant. So what I suggested in one of the very first, um, or not the very first, after a series of conversations was that we make photogravure plates for some of her collage pieces. And then she does a, a drawing or a painting essentially for a direct gravure plate. And I break everything up into layers just because I prefer printing in layered form. So one color by one color or separating things rather than trying to put too many things in one plate. I like to make as many variables as we can possibly work with. So then I was navigating with Stephen and Luke and Alex Thompson while Cynthia and I are over the phone and then we would print as many possible solutions once the plate making got underway as we possibly could. And then we would have as many conversations in the print studio with Cynthia as we could back and forth uh, with all of us sometimes, with only a few of us other times. We tried as many color trials as possible. I do sometimes take liberty, but um, to just print things to show people, I find, and I think Cynthia, you would agree, is that a visual, you can think something would look nice, but unless you try it, you're not quite sure, you know? Mm. So what Cynthia did is you, I don't know how long you worked on the drawings. Do you know, or do you remember? I do, I mean, like I, I always like working on um, a lot of pieces at once. So uh, the, the portrait uh, format um, or works, I worked um, at the same time. And then the landscape one, I worked on a different day. So I think the, the first, the, the port, I mean, the landscape format um, artwork, the one with the lady in the bathtub, I worked on first. And I think in just one day because I was like all in and I don't like taking forever to uh, finish a work whatever it is whether it's a painting or a drawing or whatever so I did that in one day and then um, the other two I think two days because I always liked to work on it and then add a few more things later on after I've looked at the drawings because sometimes you cannot be fully satisfied on like how the drawings look like and like even now I still want to add a few more things on the drawings but if I had more time I would have but um, yeah I don't really like taking so much 
time on um, a drawing or whatever. So these, I'll say three days, basically, because I was also enjoying what I was doing. So it, it differs sometimes, but I take three days, yeah. So normally if you're working in a print studio with um, a team of printers, if you consider how, how much time, you have to come in at nine in the morning and you have to leave at five. So it's a nine to five and you have to fit in your art making into that time amidst a whole variety of people that are around you. So what I think was really especially nice about this process now, even in hindsight, is how much time you were able to just dedicate to, to painting, to painting these images that were then sent in the mail. So I think it took us, as I was saying, eight months to kind of decide what we were, the fact that we were gonna make two different plates and that you would make three images and what size they were gonna be and all of the rest of that for you to actually paint them. And then I, I saw it really as uh, quite a difficult process, I have to say, because I was fighting all the videos and things that we had to make all the time. And I, when I look back on it now, I think of how nice it is because there's a document, there's a process that normally is only for inside collaborative studios that only allow like a handful of people to see what's going on all the time. And I think that's quite a nice tool these days. Oh, I cannot skip to the next slide for some reason. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> there, okay. okay. <laughs> now I can't take them. Okay, now I'm back. I'm back. Um, so we, the, the, this is the very first print that was pulled after um, we made the plate. And as you can see, there's these little tiny cutouts. So the way in which Cynthia made the plate was she, she painted everything and then actually physically cut the film out so that she could put in these little collage elements that could come in with photogravure pieces next to this, um, this drawing. This is what I think from the very onset, this very first print, you know, black is always seductive, but we play around with transparent base and we play around with warm and cool blacks. And then you can see here in the top left how she started on her drawing and then how she finished. And then all these little tiny cutouts. So she sent these cutouts to me in the mail. <laughs> so I was so worried <laughs> about what I had to put them in a very small envelope mm -hmm. and make sure that it didn't fall out or disappear when it was shipped out so there's anxiety in sending those packages sometimes hey yes, yes. <laughs> especially the drawings because um as I was I mean as I was like making the drawings I was really enjoying the the medium the charcoal the the pencil because I would add the HB pencil all over because like it made everything smoother and then add the ink on top of that or start with ink and then add the pencil on top and so the day before we had to ship everything out we had to like package everything and then I remember me and Lucy were wondering how we're going to package that and we were so worried that um, everything was going to fade away because we didn't uh, fix the the drawings I mean, I'm sure we all know that with a drawing, you have to fix it so that nothing rubs off, nothing um, stays on it or whatever, like dust and all of that. So we were deciding whether to fix it or not, because if you don't fix it, it was going to fade away. But then um, hearing from Jill that the drawings arrived um, alive, we were really glad. So we yeah. didn't have to fix it because if you fix the the drawings because it's on a film you'd have this um tiny uh bubbles or dots on it which will definitely not go away which we definitely don't see <laughs> which is really nice actually <laughs> i have to say that yeah. it has happened in one or two so the little surprise that was sent in the mail when you sent these was that you hand painted each of these little photocopy cutouts as well yeah yes, which i did which i didn't expect and then some of them also had um volume so you you actually glued them scrunched them up and glued them flat yes. so it also meant that they had texture so when we made mm -hmm. these into photogravure we scanned these into the computer luke johnson did he scanned it into the computer and he said hmm is this going to work <laughs> so there's all these little kind of magical points where if you can keep a good poker face right you in south africa waiting expectantly for us to work as fast as we can 
and us going, oh, we hope that this is going to work. That's kind of how the team yeah. always, right? You trust in each other. I think that that could be quite fun, a little bit nerve wracking sometimes. And then what's nice is because we could, we Cynthia sent us this little swatch as well. So all of these colors. So here's the color palette to kind of look at, but I know that she also wanted to make colorful works. I know that. But what I also know is that there isn't one colorful work. And in etching or in Taglio, you kind of, sometimes you have like that purple print or that blue print or, and, and because these drawings are like a one drawing, there, you can't experiment unless there's like different layers of color. So that's why we decided, I think very early on to kind of be more, um, more like your drawings, more like charcoal drawings and enrich it with these shinkale pieces. So all these different colors of paper. But then Luke said to me, this is also what I love about working with other printers is he said, well, or collectively we thought, oh my God, Luke said, we can put all these faces on the plate. So for additioning purposes, it's always how, how much time it takes to print everything. So we put 12 of the same face on the one plate, which means if it's an addition of 25, we print it three times and we're done. I love that. There's something just so nice about that. And then you're laboring over the actual print, not all the parts. Does that make sense? So this is the final first piece. And when we were looking at how we were gonna launch these, we wanted to launch one at the end of 2021, I think, December, 2021. So we launched the horizontal work, the landscape work and kept the two portrait works for later. And this one was just made of all these little tiny cutout pieces, um, all on the same paper, which is a kitakata, and then printed in different shades of brown. This is, so we printed um, from that one plate and then we um, onto the same pieces of paper and then we glue all of them, pre-glue them, and then I cut them all out. So I, I kind of just show process here more than anything else that if anybody's interested in seeing how it gets done, because these are sometimes the things that you don't know about. So there's like this amazing way of, instead of dealing with wet papers, you glue, you glue down wet onto a perspex sheet and you allow the glue with the piece of, that you're gluing. So this is something that I'm gluing. I lay that down onto a piece of Perspex and I allow it to dry there and it dries flat. And then I can pull it off later and there's a full glue, like dried glue side. And then it, it, the paper won't stretch again. So when you run it through the press like this, it registers perfectly. And the only way, it's volume again. The only way that I can get it to stick down when I put it through is just to put these little dabs of water. And then each of these little pieces of paper, I can lay them down where I want to in the gaps that Cynthia left for me. And Luke and I had fun with this one. <laughs> Sometimes there was the tilt of her head that we could play around with more than anything else, which was also kind of nice. It was part of one of our discussions, right, Cynthia? can still play. So part of the process, I think, of making prints is about being playful. And then the second two prints took much longer to resolve. <laughs> yeah, because also the, the, we were still deciding on which colors to use. We were, I think there's this one other print where it's very, very, very warm. Everything is like, um, I'm not sure if you have that image there. But I was really um, deciding between that and what it looks like now. But what I really wanted to do is um, keep the entire space almost like in black and white, but it had different, like a variety of um, dark browns. And then the artworks on the walls would be also a different tone of a brown so that it's not um, competing with each other. So it like draws you in a bit more nicely into the the space of the work which is something that we try to do with the colors of um, the ink i love how you're seduced into these rooms in different ways so when we were doing even the the first proofs you could see that they should be treated differently i think so what we did here are her little cutouts and these are the ones that were more sculptural. 
And I just thought they were so beautiful. And then Luke came up with this very beautiful silver color um, to print on. And now we're printing on like a full sheet of Gompi paper. This paper is very thin, it has a shiny surface, but you can see I can saturate it. Like It's unbelievably um, strong. So the whole sheet of paper, you get very wet. You can lay it down. Again, if you get it as wet as possible, then you can lay it down perfectly and register each of your prints. So here's just a little bit. I don't know how to control the volume on that one. I think you say, this is working perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see through me. it. Yeah, so it's just, just it. There's just a little bit of a halo around the face. Is that okay? Working together. Yeah. I time. think that maybe it's not perfect. <laughs> Um, and then we run it through the press a few times, and in this case, actually, later on, we run it through three different times in order to register everything properly into the little gaps that Cynthia provided for us. And the facilities at U of A are fantastic. I'm going to have to say some, those are some of the best facilities I've ever had the pleasure of working in. Cynthia will arrive one day. So each and every single time we run it through the press with extreme pressure for photogravure and directed wear. But this paper can go through a number of times without falling apart. It's only if it gets too wet and starts to tear, but you blot it perfectly. Like, and you can air dry it even a little bit. But it takes the ink in the crispest of, um, of possible, outcomes, I guess, for lack of a better word. And here you can just see that we've got ink or I mean glue and some of these prints that Luke was working on in the summer. I went back to Johannesburg, finally met Cynthia, I guess a year and a half after us working together. I was there for two months in the summer. And so some of the prints that Luke finished um, arrived in South Africa for us to just finish. So this is a printer at the David Crew workshop. Her name is Roxy Kaxbarak. She's helping me to glue. This is how we lay them down. You can see how transparent the one is on the right-hand side. That means that it's perfectly glued down and it's wet. And then you leave it to dry overnight. And the next day you literally pull them off. And you have like this amazing, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see the shiny surface. And then however you wanna cut down your print, on the right hand side, it's just you can cut it down to the exact size of a copper sheet and run it through the, the press and then it, it looks seamless on your print. So any of these tricks, if anyone ever wanted to know a little bit more information, very happy to share it with you. Absolutely. I, we're more about, I think, the more that people know about printmaking, the better and more exciting it gets. I think that uh, it's much the same. Cynthia has worked with so many different people now, too in print that you learn something different from each of them, right? Definitely, <laughs> all the time, actually. Sorry, I disappeared there. Um, the weather around here is a bit really, really weird. So my nose is kind of around the place. So um, that is also another part that is has been really important for me with um, with working with painting. And then now that I've met uh, Jill, and I could actually push um, working with printmaking because coming from printmaking, that actually informed most of my, um, I think, practice and how I'm actually making my paintings is uh, incorporating all of these different uh, mediums and ways of making art. So it only made sense for me to actually push further into printmaking. So these uh, different projects and um, different galleries, but mostly projects that are around the the making of the artwork, which is, you know, Jill was part of that I was very glad to have made. Just fun. <laughs> it's still <laughs> fun. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think that's even my last slide. I think some of the other one was more that there's like a few links that we could share with you guys. It was a little bit about the story and what I love too is talking about between the bouncing between the University of Alberta and the print technicians and Stephen and Luke and Alex and support of Sean and Marilyn and you know it's just uh, it was it's been wonderful. Uh, um, 
it's been a wonderful journey. And then it's been shared then to jump to Johannesburg. Um, I think these are <laughs> two very different places, but I also, you know, the, 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 I guess, like just the drive for making print possible, I think is, is very valued in both of them, which I think has been quite fun to be able to explore. So it's more that a lot of Cynthia's work, if you go onto the uh, Latitudes online and even sign up for their newsletter, it's great. Actually, if you wanna have some understanding of how many people are in the arts or working in the arts, how many painters, how many printmakers, they're all on Latitudes online. They're doing a fantastic job. <laughs> I stopped sharing now, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> okay. thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. That's really great. Um, it's great to get a bit more insight on um, how that collaboration uh, has has or continues uh, to happen. That's uh, wonderful. Um, Jesse, are there questions from the studio yet? I have some questions, but if there's qu student, student questions, we should. Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean I mean, I've got one just to kind of start. Um, I was really curious about latitudes um, when I was watching Cynthia's um, video. Oh, first of all, uh, Jill, thanks for that. Very interesting, illuminating. And um, Cynthia, thanks for staying up so late. <laughs> <laughs> Better luck this time around with the internet connection. Yes, we appreciate definitely. it. And I love the video you sent us. It was really great to see your work really appreciate that. Um, so I have a few questions about it. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to know a little bit more when you were talking about uploading images to latitudes, I wasn't sure what it was. And I also wondered if you had advice for students, um, because it seems like during the pandemic latitudes and social media really helped you to kind of open doors. And I think that's the way you put it. Um, you said that there are things that you don't really learn about the way the art world works in art school. And um, I think you said the language in which you find out is not the same as from what you've learned. So it's kind of kind of a long question, but I mean, in a nutshell, sort <laughs> of, a, you know, we want to hear about your experience and what kind of advice you have. Okay. Um... Sorry, I think I'm just loading the first question. But um, so with Latitudes, uh, by uploading was basically, I saw a post on Instagram and it said that um, applications are open for artists to apply for the Latitudes Art Fair. It was supposed to be a physical one, but because of the pandemic, it had to go online. So then I clicked on the, the link in the, their bio and then there was like a application online that you had to fill up your name and all of your details and then put up a number of artworks that you wanted to submit to Latitude and then from there um, you would receive some kind of um, confirmation that they have received your application with all of your work and then they will let you know uh, by like which date they, they will let you know that your application went through so I think by um, somewhere around late March, that's when they let me know that your application uh, was successful and uh, you have been selected. I mean, your application was approved to be part of the Latitudes Online um, Art Fair. And um, I was excited, obviously. And then from there, I think a few weeks later, the work started doing very well. I was still in my third year by then. The work started doing well. Um, a lot of people were reacting to it. A lot of people were asking questions about the works um, where I'm studying and things like that. And then that's when Latitude, because of the response I was getting, they then approached me and asked if I was um, open to them uh, basically managing and um, advising me in my practice. And so um, by then I thought maybe, okay, this is more like a gallery and artist uh, relationship, but later on, we got into um, conversations of what that relationship would look like. And it was not like a gallery because Latitudes is not like a gallery. It's just basically a platform that works with different projects and galleries, including artists. 
to showcase the work. So then that's when we built a relationship of um, how they advised me to working with different galleries, which um, I think brings, brings me to the point of um, the, lang the different languages of what you're taught in um, art school and um, what you find out. So basically it's, I remember being in, um, in class, I think second year, where they would teach, teach us, uh, I think, visual literacy, how to basically, exp um, not really explain, but put your work in words. That was um, where they were teaching us how to um, take criticism and also how to make uh, a group show and what that looks like in terms of marketing, what that looks like in um, how you put up your work, financially, what that looks like. So then, you know, as a student, uh, from my experience, I thought, okay, this is how the world will look like when I'm out of school. And so with starting the relationship with like um, Latitude and like getting so many galleries and different projects approaching me and uh, discussing how they want to work with me, it was a very different, I think they, what I thought was going to happen, it was like the opposite. Like I thought I would have to kind of I don't know, there's, um, so there's galleries in South Africa that in my um, second year or third year, I thought I had to kind of like um, level up a ladder before getting to like the biggest gallery with Goodman. But because of my experience was so different, um, it was kind of like a, a hike up. And so that that's also what I mean, the experience of what, you would you you envision your art career to go like might not be how it turns out and also I think the the simple one to also say is the communication by emails I think we are taught to learn how to paint and draw and what that looks like but like what happens in like how do you communicate in emails there's a certain language that you use in emails with like galleries and things like that and so I picked up on how Latitude will speak to clients and galleries the language was very different to what um, I thought it would be like. Um, the whole thing of dear and not hi. So, you know, the impression of like, are you professional? What language do you, can you use and how can you speak? How do you um, show yourself or present yourself? What is also what I meant by what I thought was um, in my third or second year is not a thing. It's not completely what you find out in the art world is very different. Basically, I don't know if that answers all the questions. Can I can I just add how night um, Lucy's team is quite a small team, which I think is also really nice. So you're never waiting for somebody as you do in quite a number of those bigger galleries. You're waiting for them to respond, and that it just it takes much longer. So you worked very closely with Luce and yeah. Robbie. And so I was like. I think shadowing almost because I would be copied in most of the conversations where in my uh, initial idea come uh, in my second or third year I thought um, whoever is managing me or working with me or for me would be doing all the communications for me and I will only know if they tell me but because of the relationship that I had with Latitude it was very transparent and like you know everything that's happening you know um this is how people want to communicate. This is how people want to um, collaborate so that you know everything. So that, that's also what I, I meant in um, the difference between the two. Yeah, so uh, Canada has very specific kind of arts, art, art organizations and structures. I guess part of what I'm curious about with Latitudes is if there's something like that here, or if you know, if they, if they take if they're interested in artists from other countries, or if it's specific to South Africa, or just a, a little bit more of the kind of nature of the organization for people here. Who might so, yeah. um, so basically, Latitude is like an online platform platform that brings um all the arts from Africa, and also they show other artists internationally as well. I think it's also a thing that has been happening recently where um, international galleries are now showing um, their works online with latitudes and um, different projects as well. 
artists not only from um, Africa are also able to show their work through latitude. So I think um, art, artists and art and arts from Africa is like, um, should I say, um, the overall majority, but there is different projects that Latitude uh, takes part in, diff like international um, artists and galleries um, and such. So it's from around the world, basically, just visibility like that. Okay, awesome. Is it primarily print or is it all media? No, it's different mediums, um, depending on the, the artist. So they they are a platform on their own that manages um, and manages and advises me on like my practice. And then they have other artists and galleries and projects that they're working with. So they, they're doing quite a lot of stuff. They, whether it's sculpture, printmaking, um, painting, drawing. So it depends on what the artist is doing. Um, let's say um, a different artist wants to showcase on latitude and they're doing sculpture, they can do so and just send through their, their works as well to show um, on latitudes. And then they come up on newsletters, uh, different kinds of exposure and all of that. So it's different artists from around the world, yeah. Uh, I did, um, uh, in COVID, I had a, a, did an exhibition at Griffin Art Projects. And a lot of the virtual online program actually was talking about collecting in South Africa because mm -hmm. there's something about how the collector base has grown so much in the last few years and the support is there for the arts. It's taken quite a long time. And I think it is very different here in Canada. I don't know enough um, for the Canadian system because I've only been here for a short time and very focused on what I'm printing. But I was trying to get Lucy and Robbie um, also uh, uh, possibilities for speaking to people. What they're doing actually is really innovative and it's really quick in a, in a way that it doesn't, you don't feel, I, I, well, I don't think, and even with working with Lucy, I never feel as though something isn't moving fast enough to keep up with it. And her ideas are, they're really good. They're really solid and they're really strong. And so it, I was even trying to get them to come out to work in Vancouver because there was a possibility to do that. Um, and so that might happen in the next few years. And I could always put you guys in touch, Jesse, but absolutely. Like if there was, that's really easy. Cynthia and I both, because it's quite exciting what they're doing. And I think that they're, they're offering a lot of mentoring for a young yeah. artist as well. Definitely. It's really There's definitely different kinds of, um, like I said, projects and like, I think there's mentorship for curators, for artists, for um, different um, gatherings, for galleries and things like that, art fairs. So they, they have always something to update you on around um, anything that comes up with art. Anybody here feeling um, inquisitive? I see an Alex Thompson hand up. Uh, oh. Alex, go ahead. Hi there, Cynthia and Jill. Hi. Thank you for the talk. That was great. Um, I just had a question about uh, Cynthia about your um, sort of content and your process of sort of reaching the the content that you're working through in your in your works um and i was just curious about how you find the sort of the project base or gallery based or fair based collaborations that you're doing do you find that that um somehow shapes or restricts or informs the way that you're creating the work or the content that you're choosing to uh focus mm -hmm. on um in the beginning um it it did because um, I remember saying that I had to choose between keeping um, going forward with my drawings or my paintings because I was getting more attention on my paintings but then as um, like projects taking part in different projects with Jillian had I not done that I think I was going to stick to more gallery spaces because let's be honest galleries need to sell at the end of the day and make partnerships and things like that. But if I did not um, go through with projects, I, I wouldn't have made more prints and exposed myself to, I guess, a different audience and uh, institutions and things like that, because I think art is very 
is not just sticking to just project bases, art fairs, and galleries. I think these are um, now I believe more than ever that all of these things are they they just develop and build on an artist's uh, career. I think an artist needs to at least take part in most, if not all of them, like stage by stage, I guess. Yeah. I think the difference though is that you, again, uh, I would say that, um, Alex, I don't know, you were at art fairs representing your own work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do have to say for years and years, I understand that because of, I have always stood in front of the prints of which we've made and worked at those art fairs and how different it actually is if there's somebody who's speaking on your behalf rather than yourself having to speak about the work. I think that makes a big difference. And I think all of those things are very valuable personally. Like I have to say too, Cynthia, much like you, we were kind of, I've been thrown into the deep end so many different times, if it's art fairs or if it's gallery shows, or if it's, I don't know, it's all these different kind of collaborations. You know, you do, Cynthia also did an amazing scarf that was done from one of her paintings. And Lucy has been making these for a long time. And it's mm -hmm. just all these different avenues of being creative. And then you meet yeah. different people. And then because she's working so closely with somebody like Lucy, there's conversations that they just kind of put you into. And then Cynthia kind of has someone to speak with all the time. I think that's what's really nice. So spaces like Snap and those kinds of things where you can actually have exhibitions too and talk to people. And then the international exposure or that you've been getting the last little while too is really helpful. I think the the projects are there to kind of more develop the the artist uh, practice. It's very into what the artist is doing. That's why the, I well I believe these projects are here to work on your practice, and then the galleries are like your visibility and your partnerships and who else you can get to know and things like that. And art fairs as well. It's just I think different periods and efforts, I guess. Yeah, thank you. And do you find that that there's, are you adapting sort of, this is sort of, I guess, rolls into Jesse's question a little bit, but in terms of like how you're speaking to or for the work itself, do you find that you're adapting the way that you're doing that to your audience at a gallery versus Lucy at the, the sort of um, latitudes or the actual like direct clients do you find that you're you're changing the way that you talk about it i'm not sure i fully understand do, do you mean that the way i approach my um my artworks is the same way that i work in with galleries or with um different projects and things like that just want to make sure i understand the question yeah or whether or whether you find that you're um, talking about the works perhaps to one audience in more sort of technical terms versus one audience more in sort of what the conceptual content of the work is versus, you know, um, things about sort of scale or like practicality uh, in terms of putting the work together. Like, are, are those different avenues um, things that you, you've used in different contexts or is it is it always sort of a similar kind of dialogue about the work itself that pulls in all of these mm. elements. I think it's different yeah. in a way. Yeah, it's it's very different because um, if I understand the question correctly, uh, with seeing how project-based um, galleries, they, they're not fully galleries, but it's more like they, they're not really focused on um, exclusively representing the artist versus galleries who want to do that. The communications between the two and how the two work together is um, with the artist is very different. Um, the communications and where the artists see themselves, I, I think, yeah, it, it's it's different. Yeah, I would say it's it's different, not fully similar in how we handle the other. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Pleasure. Hi, Jesse. Go ahead, Jesse. <laughs> I had another, I had kind of a practical question initially. So um, I, have a, I have a question about the work now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So another thing I was uh, intrigued by watching my video, um, one, you talked about making a 
a lot of drawings during the lockdown. And I wonder if that helps sort of cement the body of work or clarify things for you. Uh, then, I didn't yeah. hear the first part, sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, you talked about making a lot of drawings during the lockdown. Yes. yes. And I wondered how that contributed to a kind of maturation of your painting practice. Um, with the drawings, I think it's it's it was coming very very much from a very expressive um, part because with the paintings, uh, I mean they're very joyful and um, I mean they attract you because of the colors and composition and things like that. But with the, I think what my uh, paintings took from my drawings is the the depth of the the concept. I think the the more I I I drew, the more I started to understand my concept even more that um, translated into my paintings because I mean we can paint pretty flowers and add clothes, the aesthetics and all of that, but my paintings I, I think really helped me connect more with my concept because of how quickly drawn you are to the drawings and how more I think with the drawings they connect very quickly to the overall concept but with the the painting is kind of like you dance around with dancing around the message so yeah okay. yeah okay. if that's answering the question but yeah I would say that cool I appreciate it uh, and then I had just a, a final thing kind of about the concepts um I'm a big fan of figures and interiors. It's a really interesting work for sure. You've talked about a couple of artists who influenced you, uh, and one of whom was presenting characters from historical events or characters from sort of African stories or yes. philosophy. Yes. And another artist who um, was mainly sort of paying homage to other to other artists before him but with a yeah. kind of political some political edge yeah same I thing as why is talk about that second thing just a little bit because I, I was looking at those images and really intrigued i wanted to know uh, well as in like the the difference between the two or what drawn me to the the artist well, like as a kind of topic sentence, this this person is using um, is using he's, he's referencing other artists in his painting, but mm. the paintings also have a kind of political content. If you could talk a bit about the way that happens in his work, okay, okay, if possible, maybe you know the way that what about it appeals to you and how it affects you. Well. I think I was really, um, I really liked the idea of paying homage to other artists because um, the whole idea of originality, um, each artist needs to find their own style and things like that. I think it's like taking the works that are already there and then making a, a, like a new conversation from there. It's like, you don't wanna make a new conversation where they, there has been this conversation all along. So with Sam Ghetto's work, I really appreciated the, the fact that maybe he wants to speak on housing issues, for example, and he would um, put it in this in the space where it looks very calming and it looks like they're about to have a meeting or something like that, and then have a specific work of an artist during the time where maybe they were fighting for homes and uh, fighting for the land and things like that. So I think creating those conversations for me was something that I was really drawn to, to kind of take reference from artists that speak about the same thing and these works creating a conversation within the context that you're creating. So that's what I really appreciated about his work is paying homage to the artists that are already there and have been there while talking about things that you want to express or talk about. Thanks. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. So we're at the one hour mark. Cynthia probably wants to go to bed soon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe last last call for any any final questions for Cynthia. 
Any final words, Jill or Cynthia, that you <laughs> want to leave us with? Um, Jill? No, just thank you. Yeah. It's nice. It's it's always like nice listening, you know, and hearing from different people and sharing. I think uh, there there's lots to be learned. I think through conversation, personally, and I think just listening to each other is a very nice thing. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I said this when we first hopped into the call, but didn't have a chance to share it. Uh, with everyone, but I think, um, you know, the sort of early career stage that Cynthia's at is really um, exciting for undergraduate and graduate students to hear about and learn from, um, as well as the, the print collaboration and the way that your work is sort of translating through that, through that process. I think there's lots, uh, lots that's very exciting there. Uh, many thanks, Cynthia and Jill, for taking the time to speak with us Thank you so much. today. Just some closing reminders for folks. Uh, our final BADF speaker for fall 2022, Claudine Janishan, is presenting via Zoom on Tuesday, November 29th at 10 a.m. Uh, and that will wrap us for the fall term. Uh, and with that, I think we'll let everyone carry on with their afternoon or very late evening, as the case may be. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> Cynthia, I know it's very late there. No, Thanks, no everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take good care. Bye.